good afternoon, morning, or night. Really, whenever you find yourself watching the presentation. I'm Austin Markwell. And I'm Joshua Tucker. Today we'll be speaking about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the CFAA for short. Austin, why don't you start us out with a brief history of what the CFAA is? Josh, I can do that. The CFAA was first passed by Congress in 1984 as an amendment to the Comprehensive Crime Act, or the CCCA, of the same year. In essence, the CFAA was the first action taken by the federal government to define and try and punish computer crime. Interesting fact, the CFAA was made as a reaction to the 1983 film War Games. I saw that movie. Really just a fantastic film. Pinnacle of the 80s, right up there with Red Dawn. Matthew Broderick at his finest. Oh yeah, totally. His best work. Like, it was great. Oh, man, War Games. Oh, right, yeah, presentation. CFAA, back to it. So, although the creation of this act was tied to an overreaction to a Matthew Broderick film, the CFAA was a much needed change. This was a world of ever advancing technological prowess, and at the time, there were no rules or regulations. The first version of the CFAA was a little rough around the edges. It was pushed through quite quickly to meet the timeline for the CCCA that it was an amendment to. Uh, this first version of the CFAA only allowed for its use in instances of extreme national interest. So if you had a public computer and something happened, no help, no matter the damages. The second version of the CFAA changed this wording to include other public computers. So that's a good change. After the second version of the CFAA came out in 1986, there have thus been seven more revisions. And by the look of it, we'll see a few more in the future. Now we'd like to move our discussion away from this histor historical part of the CFAA and move into its implications. Although Congress had good intentions in the creation of the CFAA, in recent years there has been a disconnect between the original intent of the CFAA and how it is currently being used. The original CFAA was specific in its definitions of the unique circumstances in which it could be applied against an alleged computer criminal. Application of the CFAA was limited to actions that directly affected important federal interests. Now, although this was a good first step in creating legislation to define computer crime and to determine punishments for said crimes, this left many situations outside the purview of the CFAA. Let's say a hacker maliciously entered a system and deleted a large amount of financial information. If none of the information pertained to national interests, well, too bad then. Zero charges could be brought using the CFAA. Obviously, changes had to be made, and the first major one took place in the 1986 revision to the Act. Congress had then increased the range of the CFAA to public computers if the crime was severe enough. Then the 1994 revision added civil remedies to the CFAA. Now, victims of criminals charged under the CFAA could be awarded damages deemed fair by the court. So far, so good for the revisions of the CFAA. Right, and those amazing changes continued up until present day, so you can sleep safe and sound knowing that you were protected from immoral hackers. There we go, presentation done. Great job. Well, no, not really. Oh, right, I forgot the portions of the CFAA that went horribly wrong. Well, I wouldn't say horribly. Horribly! Okay, not horribly, but it's certainly been a mixed bag of both good and bad to the recent changes of the CFAA. As technology advanced in the 2000s, the reach of the CFAA has extended over and over and over again. But Congress didn't do this. Nah. To see where this change really happened, we have to look at the U.S. Judicial Branch. Now, like many historical things, the Legislative Branch first passed the law, but they didn't really do much more. 
they didn't really define anything. So any vagueness in an act or law had to be determined by the courts. Well, guess what? There's a ton of vagueness in the CFAA. So sure, Congress was nice enough to say, if you incurred damages in a cybercrime, you can be awarded some losses. But what's the damage, really? That was left to the court to say. So, for example, should a business get money back for the wages of labor used to fix any damages made during a cyber attack? Definitely. Okay. How about covering any labor charges that were needed to fix any security issues, any back doors that were found during the attack? Should those be covered? I suppose. That kind of seems like something that could just be done by the company since it was an oversight on their part. But... What about damage done to the reputation of a company? Sure, I guess. Well, maybe. I don't know. Exactly. Loss is hard enough to determine in cases where there are physical losses and damages. It's even harder when stuff's done online. Now, like, take for instance a online storefront. It's pretty easy to determine some losses and damages. Like, okay, the cost that it takes to get the website back up and running. And, say, the cost of how much revenue was lost was while the storefront was down. Again, those are pretty easy to determine. Others, not so much. Like reputation. How do you really define that? I mean, Target and Home Depot were both very worried about their reputations when they were hit a few years ago. They're doing fine now, so damage to reputation, you could say it wasn't really much, if anything at all. And then going on to the actual system itself, fixing those security features that the hacker or cracker used to get into the system. Should those be covered? Well, let's take a look at it in terms of an actual physical theft. Say, a bank didn't have any security or had bad security, and the thief just kind of walks in, grabs the money, and walks out. Would we expect this thief to pay for a new security system for the bank? Eh. Well, in 2000, the Ninth Circuit Court of the United States uh, actually went and gave a definition for loss. So, definition for loss now includes <coughs> the cost of damage assessments and any lost revenue or costs associated with an interruption in service. Sure, still pretty vague, but at least there's some definition in the books. But along with this definition for loss, the opinion of Middleton also concluded that cases where the CFAA was used and there's vagueness in it, that vagueness should be interpreted as the actual intent of the Congress. So if a prosecution brings up this vague point, it should be given that Congress was like, yeah, we intended that to be the case. Well, that causes a problem because now we have a bunch of overzealous prosecutors bringing crazy charges against alleged offenders. And this has happened quite a bit. Matthew Keyes here was a journalist, and he was fired from his job. In 2010, a year later, he leaked a username and password of his former employee system to a hacker. And Keyes was convicted of conspiracy to cause damage to a protected computer, transmission of malicious code, and attempted transmission of malicious code. Now, with these three felonies, Keyes was looking at up to 25 years in federal prison. Sure. Was what he did a pretty petty thing? Yeah. Should it be 25 years in prison? No. Overzealous prosecution. And this is Dominic Green. Dominic was in 8th grade when he was charged for multiple felonies under the CFAA. What did Dominic do? Well, he was accused of the horrible crime of overseeing his teacher type in their network security password and then later using that password overzealous prosecution. Oh, and by the way, the teacher's password? It's their last name. Great security. This is Aaron Schwartz. 
Many of you probably recognize him since his is the most high profile case where the CFAA has been used. Schwartz was charged with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of the CFAA. His actions? He used his personal JSTOR account to access JSTOR's databases and proceeded to download all of their articles. Now his intentions were to liberate all these articles to the public. So his actions were against JSTOR's terms and conditions and therefore were punishable. However, the federal government were bringing charges that included a maximum punishment of 35 years in federal prison along with a million dollar fine. And the federal government brought these charges even after JSTOR dropped all civil charges against Aaron because he surrendered the data that he downloaded. Because of these high penalties, Aaron decided to take his own life proceeding to trial. Again, this is another example of prosecutors trying to get overzealous prosecution against alleged offenders. The death of Aaron Schwartz led to a public outcry against overly stringent penalties being brought against persons due to the prosecutor's use of the CFAA. In reaction to this, legislatures from both the House of Representatives and the Senate have introduced a bill referred to as Aaron's Law. The goal behind this legislation is to limit the potential infractions that can be prosecuted. This change would also constrain the ambiguous clause, access without authorization, by defining it. Granted, this countermeasure to the CFAA's rapidly advancing power has yet to be passed, and the extent of its potential restraining effect is unknown. The CFA has been used to make reasonable changes such as in the case of United States versus Kramer, where the CFAA was used to define any mobile phone as a computer, and therefore also under the authority of the CFAA, that could perform arithmetic, logical, and storage functions. Especially in light of the abilities of modern smartphones, this decision made an entirely reasonable expansion of the CFAA's scope of machines under its purview. As the Internet of Things expands and other form factors become more complex and capable computing devices, the CFAA's reach may soon be expanded to include smartwatches, e-readers, and other small wearable technologies. All in all, the CFAA is a much needed act. We need some sort of security and some sort of way to define what laws are online and how to punish them. However, we've seen a recent transition of people being overpunished for these crimes. Now, we've seen again and again in the media, even with President Obama's uh, speech back in January, that we need to raise the punishments for hackers, which we shouldn't, as we've seen. We see too many people throughout the United States doing small things and getting huge consequences. So although we do need the CFAA and the punishments and laws that it provides, we need to go in and revise and redefine these things that it uses so that we can actually give adequate punishments for actions. I'm Austin Markwell. And I'm Joshua Tucker. Thanks again, CCS 590.